good afternoon. So uh, let us continue the lesson. So I think we finalize this here. But before continuing to the next lesson, let me just complete uh, some ideas here. So something that I want you to know is the notion of a bounded sequence, okay? Bounded Okay, so what do I mean by a bounded sequence? It means that you have a sequence, but all the terms of this sequence is uh, are smaller than a number and all of them are also bigger than a number, okay? For example, if you consider a n to be sine n, this is a bounded sequence. Why? Because for all n, a n is at most one, and at least minus one, okay? So you can say that this is bounded from above to one, and it is bounded from below to minus one, okay? Or for example, if I consider this sequence Bn, it becomes one over n. That is also a bounded sequence. Why? Because for every n, 1 over n, which is your bn, is definitely a smaller than 2, for example, and definitely positive. So you see that all values of bn are between 0 and 2. So, all, so this is a bounded sequence. That's also a bounded sequence. Of course, a sequence might be bounded from above, but not bounded from below, yes? For example, if I consider, uh, let me consider Cn. Let us make it as simple as possible. This Cn, it is not bounded from above, but it is bounded from below. Why? Because for all n, Cn is definitely greater than zero. Because this sequence is the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., etc. It's, it's actually increasing without any bound from above, but it is bounded below, okay? I can write the other way around. For example, I can write a minus n. Then this sequence is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc. So for all n, dn is less than 0. So this means that this sequence is bounded from above to 0, but it is not bounded below because it can be uh, uh, arbitrarily small and negative. Okay, so that's the meaning of being a bounded. But something that's also good to know, there is no guarantee that a bounded sequence is also convergent, but the other way around is always true. So if you have a sequence that is convergent, it's always bounded, okay? I just want you to know these pieces of information, okay? So it means that if the limit of a n, n goes to infinity of a sequence exists, then you can conclude that a n is bounded. It's good to know these uh, statements, but not the other way around. If a n is bounded, there is no guarantee that you can conclude that it is convergent. For example, can you uh, remember a counterexample from what we had in the previous lesson? You remember we had a fun we had a sequence. I didn't talk about boundedness at that time, but if you think a little bit harder, you will find a sequence which is bounded, but it is not convergent. Of course, this is also uh, the case. This sign n is bounded, and it is not convergent. Okay, uh, but we talked about something in a specific yes. No, this, in sequences, we always and always send n to infinity, okay? It means that by increasing the number of term, I want to see what is the behavior of the terms of my sequence. So this is not like functions. In functions, we have x, we could send x to infinity, or we also could send n to a number. But in the form, in the sequences, this is why some books even don't write this. They just write the limits of a n, because by convention, there is only one way to think about the limit of sequences, and that is the case when n goes to infinity, okay? So 
so this this another phrase another uh, terminology that we use here we sometimes say the limit exists or we say that a n converges these two phrases are equivalent okay so do you remember i talked about this sequence a n minus one to power n do you remember this sequence this is a good sequence that you should have in the back of your head sometimes it is useful to remember this this sequence is not convergent do you remember i had the argument yesterday but is it bounded or not yes because the values are either minus one or one so for example if i write for all n a n is somewhere between two and minus two you agree with me because the elements are either one or minus one and that's always correct so this means that this sequence is bounded but by the argument i presented last session this sequence is not convergent so this means that boundedness does not imply convergence but convergence imply boundedness and of course if a sequence is not bounded yes you can conclude that the sequence is not convergent because i always told you that whenever in mathematics you prove that p implies q it immediately means that not q implies not p so i'm saying that convergence implies boundedness if i write the other way around which is called the contrapositive statement means uh, if it is not bounded then it is not convergent so that's also possible okay so remember this and i would say that unboundedness implies divergence divergence means not convergence non-convergence yes divergence so these are the good phrases to know another notion that i want you to know is the notion of a subsequence yes so that's also important at least be familiar with the term so if you have a sequence uh, for example let me just write a1 a2 a3 and etc this is your sequence and then you set up a sequence of natural numbers in ascending order for example i write n1 i write n2 i am just making a sequence all of these numbers are coming from the set of natural numbers yes but with one condition n1 is strictly smaller than n2 n2 is strictly smaller than the next one this one is strictly smaller than the next one and continues okay for example let me make it more tangible i would write let me take n1 to be 2. i take n2 a natural number which is strictly larger than 2 so let me take it 5. yes and i don't know i will take the other one so let me take it 10 and then then the other one 11 and then you can continue what i mean i mean that you have a list of natural numbers which is arranged in a strictly ascending order okay and then what you do you go this is number two you go and pick up number the second term and write it here you would write a2 yes and then the next one is five you go in this list pick up the number number five which becomes a five yes and then you have a 10 in this list you go here and pick up a 10 yes and then you go here you have 11 you go here pick up a 11 and then if for this sequence you will find another sequence which is consisting of the terms of the original sequence but not all of them okay this sequence that you form in this way is called a subsequence of the previous sequence okay so it is not just randomly choosing some of them whenever you choose a number and put it there you are no longer allowed to choose the previous ones if you want to choose you have to choose the ones coming later so that is the only obligation that's the terminology that i'm defining for you that's the meaning of a subsequence yes 
So for so I can call this sequence another sequence. Let me name it B. I would write it BN. But if I ask you what is B1, B1 is A2. What is B2? B2 is A5. What is B3? B3 is A10. Okay, so if you want to, what was 2? Do you remember 2 was N1? So I can write this is A N1. What A5 means 5 is N2. So I can, another name for this is N2. Uh, and this is A N3. So this sequence that you set up is called a subsequence of your original sequence. Okay? Okay, so let us be more uh, concrete here. For example, let me just uh, write a sequence for you, A. 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5, and etc. The sequence of reciprocals of natural numbers. Okay, now I write a sequence here for you. 1 over 2, 1 over 4, I pick the even numbers. 1 over 6, 1 over 8, and etc. Do you agree with me that what I have written here is a subsequence of what was there? Why is that? First of all, all the terms that you see here definitely appear in the previous list as well if I continue. Yes? So all these numbers that you see here are coming here. But if I ask you which term is one half, this is term number two. Which term is one over four? This is term number four. Which term is this? This is term number six. This is term number eight. And these are strictly increasing. So this, yes, that is a subsequence of the previous sequence. Yes? Understandable? Okay. Uh, for example, uh, I can write a subsequence of li uh, like this. One, one over three, one over five. I don't know, one over seven. And etc. Et et so the terms that you see here are coming from my original sequence, and the num the term number is in ascending order. Why? Because this is the first term, this is the third term, this is the fifth term, and these are actually ascend in an ascending order. So that's also a subsequence of my original sequence. Yes. Now, I just want to think a little bit about this intuitively. If my original sequence converges, what can you say or at least think about the convergence or divergence of its subsequences? So, for, for example, here, can you guess what is the limit of this sequence? We had this before as well, because if I want to write the general formula for this sequence, it's very simple to see it's 1 over n. And if I ask you what is the limit, we, kept, we this, uh, demonstrated this before. What was the limit of this? It was 0. So it means that if here is 0, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if I, if I have an interval, an open interval around 0, okay, some of these terms might be outside. For example, if this is 1 and this is very small, 1 is outside, 1 over 2 is outside. But if I start increasing the number of n, then suddenly after a term, every term will be included in this interval. And if I make the interval shorter, of course, I will lose some of the points. But after a point, after a certain point, then everything will be inside here. Even if I make it smaller, this will happen for the next, next interval. Okay. Now, my question is that if this sequence, goes to zero based on this argument what is your guess about the limit of all subsequences of that sequence the same thing yes agree because if all the terms are here after a while it means that all of these terms after a while will be inside there so it doesn't matter again yes is that clear because when you say that when you say that the limit of this sequence is zero, so it means that if I choose any, any, or I choose every open interval containing zero, after a term, after a specific term, all these terms will be inside here. 
okay when i say after a term all the terms will be inside here so that is clear that after the term all of these terms will also be here because these are only among they are, they are coming from these sequence yes so this is also a very good thing to know so that if you have a sequence that converges if the sequence of if the sequence a n converges to l to say l then every subsequence of that of a n also converges to l the idea is exactly the real proof is also this but you have to make it more precise when you want to write it but intuitively it is very clear so one thing is important if you find a subsequence of a sequence that does not converge you can conclude something about the original sequence yes what is that here we just intuitively learn that if my sequence is convergent to a number l every subsequence of that sequence also converges to the same l now assume that you have a sub you have a sequence but you manage to find a subsequence of that bigger sequence that does not converge then what can you conclude the big one doesn't converge okay so that's also good or or assume that you found two subsequences one subsequence converged to l1 one subsequence converged converges to l2 but l1 and l2 are not equal so what can you conclude about the original sequence again they don't converge again so the, the original sequence does not converge again yes because if it converges it should so it means that it should when you say that this sequence converges to l it means that after a while every term will be accumulated around that point okay so now for example another way to prove that this sequence does not converge is to look at two subsequences of this sequence yes for example let us consider only the even terms a to n what happens it becomes minus one to power two n it becomes one do you agree a sub two n is a subsequence because these numbers what is the first count what is the first number it's two the second number is four the third number is six and they are in the ascending order yes so a sub two n is a subsequence of this term but if I put 2n instead of n, it becomes minus 1 to power even, which is 1. And if I ask you what is a sub 2n and minus 1, this is the subsequence uh, consisting of odd terms. It becomes minus 1 to power 2n minus 1, which is minus 1. Okay, so here, let me call this sequence bn. Let me call this sequence cn okay now i ask you what is the limit of bn and what is the limit of cn so here bn is a subsequence of that sequence cn is also a subsequence of that sequence and i am asking you by looking at this because it is extremely simple can you tell me what is the limit of b of n every b of n is equal to one independent of my choice of n so what is the limit of a constant uh, sequence if all the terms of my sequence are one 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 it converges to what one yes yeah? so the limit of this subsequence is one but what is the limit of cn as another subsequence is minus one but these two are not equal so yeah, i can immediately conclude that my original sequence is not converging so that's also an extremely powerful tool. I just want you to know a little bit about these ideas, but not very deep, okay? Is that understandable? Okay, let me ask you one question. So now, if I, this is the reason that actually I brought this up because I want you to understand it a little bit. If I say that the limit of a n, n goes to infinity, is l, what can you say about the limit of a n plus 10? n goes to infinity 
and why i want you to make it precise for me intuitively you can guess of course but what is the relation of this question that i just asked and what and what i described here what's the answer first of all what is your guess about this limit it's again l so what's happening so can you tell me why how do you look at this a n plus 10 do you agree with me is a subsequence of a n yes because if i write this sequence you write a1 a2 a i don't know up to a9 a10 a11 and then you start continuing but if i call this one bn and i ask you to start writing b1 b2 b3 etc you write b1 of course b2 b3 etc but what is b1 b1 is a11 so b1 is a11 and what is b2 b2 is a12 what is b3 it's a13 yes and then you continue so now you get this list but do you agree this list that i generated right now is a subsequence of the original sequence yes why because these numbers are strictly increasing the, the indices not the terms itself so this sequence if this sequence converges to l we just learned intuitively that every subsequence of that sequence also converges to the same number l so that's the reason that if this is l that is also l okay now let us actually go to the new lesson which is the important part here so we want to talk about infinite series okay okay so this means that i give you a sequence a n any sequence by the way the good notation for a sequence is to write it like this yes so assume that you have a sequence that n is a natural number and if i ask you to calculate this you don't have any problems yes for example what i mean i mean find a1 read a1 from your sequence read a2 up to a10 and then add these numbers so you don't have any problems even if i raise it to up to 1 million it becomes harder but it is essentially the same problem so you have to add 1 million numbers okay but the point becomes hard if i raise it if i write up to infinity because we have to give a definition for that what do i mean adding infinitely many terms together yes so so we have to give a definition for that okay of course it should also square with our intuition about this it's a sum actually i'm using the notation of a sum but i just go from the first term up to the last term here the last term is the i cannot achieve the last term yes so i want to give a meaning to this so the meaning that i want to give to this according to the definition is that you whenever you see such a sum which is called an infinite series what you do you start setting up a new sequence which is called the the sequence of partial sums the sequence uh, of partial sums and we sh we denote it by s sub n and infinity so you see i give you a series infinite series and whenever you have an infinite series in front of the sigma notation you have a sequence now you take that sequence and set up a new sequence how you say that s1 by definition is the first term a1 okay but sn when n is larger than one is equal to a1 plus a2 up to a n here n is greater than two Oh, greater than or equal to two okay so i give you an infinite series you take the sequence there and you want to set up a new sequence the sequence is called sn the sequence of partial sums s1 is by definition the first term but what is s2 s2 is the sum of the first and the second term 
S3 is the sum of the first, the second, and the third. So you make up a new sequence, okay? So when you make up a new sequence, then there are two possibilities for your new sequence. Either this sequence is convergent or it is divergent. If this sequence is convergent, it means that the limit of Sn when n goes to infinity is a number s. Okay? Then I would say this, this sum is equal to s. Okay? And if the limit, if Sn is divergent, So let me write it here. So if Sn is divergent, I say that sigma An is divergent. Yes, so it means that I have defined the convergence or divergence of an infinite series based on the divergence and convergence of a specific sequence which is called the sequence of partial sums yes and by the way this is reasonable yes because what is intuitive what what is the uh, idea behind that because you calculate sn it means that you have the sum of the first n terms when you want to calculate from one to infinity so you want to add these terms from number one up to infinity yes so this means that you want to send n to infinity so this is why when you set up a new sequence and calculate the limit of that sequence when goes n goes to infinity and if you are lucky and it becomes a number it's a reasonable number to associate with this sum because that's what we are doing yes we are actually increasing the number of terms from the first term up to the very very last term which we will not achieve of course there so is that clear? The original the original series is is convergent and whatever you get for the value of this limit is by definition the sum of this infinite series. Yes, so that is the way it works. For example, for example, let me just make some examples to make it very clear. So let me ask you about this. Sigma n, n goes from one to infinity. Okay, so is this series divergent or convergent? So the first thing that I have to do, I have to set up a new sequence here for me. Here, the sequence a n is just n. Okay, and then if I ask you what is S1, S1 is just A1, which is 1, I replace N with 1. And if I ask you what is Sn, Sn is A1 plus A2 up to An. And what is A1 is 1, what is A2 is 2, up to what is An is N. Yes, but there is a formula for this sum from 1 to n, yes? If you remember, this formula is n times n plus 1 over 2. So this means that I was able to find the, partials, uh, the, the sequence of partial sums in a closed form. Closed form means something equal to it without these three dots, okay? So this means that uh, the sequence that I have right now is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Now I can momentarily forget about the original infinite series which is given to me, and I think about this sequence. There are no sum in summation notation here, you see, this is a, just a sequence. And I ask you, what is the limit of Sn? Yes, when n goes to infinity. This is simple to answer. What is this limit of this sequence? Infinity, yes? So it becomes what? Infinity. So you would say because the sequence of partial sums diverges to infinity, this infinite series also diverges to infinity. So if you want to write unofficially, you can write this is equal to infinity. So then what you put here is the limit of the sequ partial sequence of partial sums. Yes? 
But this is, of course, not always possible. It's not that easy. Here, I was able to write this as a closed formula, but that is, there is no guarantee that I can always do this. Okay, but let me try to at least give you some examples. For example, I don't need even to make it so complicated. Let us consider, I will talk about this uh, series later. That's a famous series in this context. For example, let us consider this series. 1 over n, n goes from 1 to infinity. I want to understand the convergence or divergence of this series. So how should I do that? The first thing that I do, I will set up Sn. Sn, you can write it in this way. You can write the first term plus the second term until the nth term, or you can write this also as a sigma. So you can write sigma 1 over k, but change k from when. So let k runs from 1 to n. This n is that n that you see here. Do you agree? This is just Sn. Because if I ask you what is Sn, if this is your a n, s n is nothing except a 1 plus a 2 up to a n. If I ask you what is a 1, you put 1 instead of n, it becomes 1. What is a 2? It is 1 over 2. What is a 3? It's 1 over 3 and up to 1 over n. Either you keep it like that or you can write it as a sigma 4. Okay, now you see that you are in trouble because we do not have any formula that can be written instead of this sum without these three dots. In that case, it was easy. As yes? 1 plus 2 up to n, I was able to uh, collect it into a very compact form, but I have to live with it. There is no formula in front of it. So uh, still, the problem is a standing. So the problem is, how can I calculate the limit of Sn? Yes, so it means that I have to find a way to calculate the limit of Sn when n goes to infinity. If I can, of course, then I am done. And then I, the, the bad news is that most of the time we can't. Okay, most of the time we cannot calculate the limit of this sequence. So we should find a way at least to convince ourselves if it is convergent or divergent. Okay, so that is at most what you can expect for some cases. Okay, so is that clear? That's the problem. But let me do some practice about uh, this definition first so that we can work it out. Okay, for example, if I give you this sigma uh, minus 1 to power n, n goes from 1 to infinity. This is an infinite series. Okay, I want to ask you, what is your opinion about the convergence and divergence of this infinite series? So far, we haven't studied any other tool, okay? So this means that we have to use the definition. Later, immediately you realize that this is not convergent. We will see why. But assume that you have the only this definition in front of you, and you want to use that definition to understand if it is convergent or divergent. So what you are supposed to do, the first thing is that, interpret this as a sequence a n and then try to write s n what is s n s n is a 1 plus a 2 up to what a n but let me write this sequence what happens what is a 1 a 1 is negative 1 yes what is a 2 a 2 is positive 1 yes what is a 3 negative 1 and this list will continue, yes? So it will continue until I reach to the last one. But depending on n, if it is even or odd, I will end up with some scenario like this. Do you agree with me? This would be what, I've, what, what I will see. Because if n is odd, it should be minus 1. And if as n is even, it should end up with a positive 1. So this is what I get. Okay, even though, so this is easy to find a compact formula. Can you write it in a way that I do not see these three dots? Because these numbers are so simple, minus one, one, minus one, one, I am adding them. Can you write something in front of this equality without these three dots? 
No, because minus one to power n. Uh, no, it's not. So can you write something? It's not hard. You just do some trial and error, yes? You go to a scratch paper. What is the first one is minus one. What is the second one is minus one plus one, which is zero. If I continue with three terms, what's the answer? Minus one. If I continue with four terms, what's the answer? Is zero. So you see the sum is not one single number. It is either minus one or zero, okay? So this means that this becomes equal to, it is minus one if n is odd, and it is zero if n is even. So I would say that it is zero minus one n odd, and zero n even, yes? Okay, so this means that if I ask you what is S to N, you can answer me. And if I ask you what is S to uh, N minus one, again, you can answer me. When I write S sub two N, I mean my index is an even number. So this means that I have even number of terms added. And if N is even, the answer is zero. So S to N is zero. If I ask you what is S sub two N minus one, the answer is minus one. Do you agree? Now my question is that, my question is that, is this sequence convergent or divergent? I didn't answer to this question directly yet, but I realized that this sequence is always zero. When a sequence is always zero, what is its limit? What is its limit? It's zero. And if this sequence is always minus one, so what is its limit is minus one. Okay, now look here. What is the terminology I use for this here? What is this sequence with respect to Sn? It's a subsequence, yes? So S2n is a subsequence of Sn which converges to zero. S2n minus 1 is also a subsequence of for that sequence, but it converges to a different number minus 1. Because of what we just talked about, this, these two are not equal, so this means that my original sequence is not convergent. Okay, so this means that this infinite series is not convergent either. Yes? So this is a conceptual question. The algebra is very simple but it is reviewing the terms and statements that are actually important to know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and converge, yes, that's the idea. But what is the original one? The original one is Sn. What is Sn? Is the sequence of partial sums of, of infinite series. By definition, it diverges. Okay? But let me solve some more interesting problems now. So what happens if I ask you about this? We want to know about convergence or divergence of this, of this infinite series. By the way, a little bit later, we will, uh, we will study theorems that you can immediately realize this is convergent. But even in that case, sometimes they ask you, if it is convergent, find its sum. Okay, so you need to know this trick as well. Uh, so what should I do first? As before, so I would say Sn is what is sigma, if I call this A sub n, Sn is the sum of the terms from the first one up to number n, so I can write it as a sub k, k goes from 1 to n, yes? First of all, let me ask you, is it confusing or not? I can write Sn in this form, yes? Everyone agrees with that? Okay. Now again, this is a sigma, so it means that if I open this sigma, I will face these three dots again. 
is it possible to get rid of these three dots? For that case, the answer was yes. For this case, which was apparently simpler than this one, the answer was no. But uh, again, the answer will be yes. So I want to teach you this trick. Okay. Sometimes there's, this is called telescopic sum. Sometimes this sigma forms a telescopic sum. What do I mean by a telescopic sum? I mean something like this. If I have a sigma, so let me just write with a different color. That's not part of this solution. So I would write sigma. Uh, I don't know. I write a function which depends. So let, let me put the counter of my sigma k and let me run it from m to a larger number n. So m is less than or equal to n. Okay, but in front of sigma, I have a particular combination. What is my combination? I have, for example, f of k plus 1 minus f of k. This is your particular combination. It means that inside the sigma, you have the difference of two functions which depend, both depend to the count, on the counter, but the counters differ by one unit only. Okay? Why this is important? Because it, it would be extremely simple to calculate this sum. Immediately, you can get rid of this sigma notation. Why? Let me just expand so that you understand what is going on. So first of all, instead of k, you put m. So this becomes f of m plus 1 minus f of m. This will be your first term when I put k equals to m here. Then I increase m to m plus 1 and put it instead of k again. So it becomes f of m plus 2 minus f of m plus 1. Yes? And then I will do the same things and I will continue. So let me continue one more. I choose the next one, which is m plus 2. I put it instead of k, so it becomes m plus 3 minus f of m plus 2. And I continue this process until I finish all the terms. So before reaching to n, I definitely reach to n minus 1. So I put n minus 1 instead of k. So it becomes f. Instead of this, I put n minus 1 plus 1 is n and then minus f of n minus 1, yes. And finally, the last term when I put n. So let me write it here. So it becomes f of n plus 1 minus f of n, okay? And then I have to add them, yes. Yes, I, I should add them all. But it is like a telescope, yes. So these terms one by one will cancel each other. Yeah? So the, what happens, this f of m plus 1, which is positive, will be canceled by f m plus 1, which is negative. Yes? f m plus 2, which is positive, will be canceled by f m plus 2, which is negative. And then if you consider this, this will be canceled. Everything actually will be canceled. So you see f of n will be canceled with this one. f of n minus 1 will be canceled with the previous one. There are only two terms which is left for you. This term is left and this term is left. Yes? So this means that this sigma is equal to Fn plus 1 minus Fn. So you see, I got rid of the sigma notation. If, of course, I have this particular combination in front. And the rule of thumb is this. Whenever you see that you have this telescopic sum, what you do, you get rid of sigma notation, but you need to do what? You take the larger number and put it instead of the k with the larger index, so it becomes fn plus 1, and then you put the smaller number in the other one, so it becomes minus f of m. So this is a very important formula, actually. So let me write it down here for you. So uh, sigma f of uh, k plus 1 minus f of k. And then k starts from a number m up to a bigger number n. The answer becomes f of n plus 1 minus f of m. Okay?
So now I hope that, so, but this needs practice and I haven't seen hard ones in the exam because they could be really tricky, okay, to find this because you see that for the time being, I hope that you agree with me, this is not a telescopic sum. It is not a, even a sum. It's a product here, yes? So, uh, sorry, it's not a difference. It's not a difference between two terms. It is the product of two terms. But for the telescopic sum, this is the sum, I need the difference of two terms in a very particular form. But then you have to be a little bit creative and of course practice a lot if you want to solve hard problems in this day. But I don't think they will give you hard problems of this type. There are some of them in your course book, of course. Okay, so how can I do that? So Sn is sigma one over k, k plus one. K goes from one to n. So this is now the solution. Instead of k, this one, you you write this, you might wonder why I'm doing this, but you will see that it will work. Yes? Instead of 1, I write k plus 1 minus k. Okay? Why this is good? Can you see now why? Because I can divide this by that. So let me just do it step by step this time. Minus k divided by k, k plus 1. Yes? This becomes this. So what I have done, I have rewritten this in this form. But now this k plus 1 and k plus 1 are cancelled. This k and that k are cancelled. I get sigma what k, no, sorry, 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. And k goes from 1 to n. I hope that you agree this is exactly the right combination. Yes, I have a difference. What is playing the role of your function? Your function is f of x is equal to 1 over x. Then if I ask you what is this, this is nothing except f of k. This is nothing except f of f of k plus 1. Okay, it doesn't matter in which order I have written it down. This, for, this property of telescopic sum will still apply, yes? So what is the answer? So you need to write this, you go to the one which has a higher counter and replace that k with the higher value. So, and then go here and replace it with one. So this is nothing except one over one minus one over n plus. So this sequence, I was able to get rid of these three dots, which is this sigma notation. So if I ask you what is Sn, you will tell me that Sn is 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. Please tell me, if you don't understand, I can explain. Is that understandable? I hope that you agree with me, even though I wrote the formula f of k plus 1 first and f of k second. Here it is the other way around, but it still it works. Yes? Yes or no? Because you can put k equals to 1, k equals to 2, and see that they will actually cancel each other one by one. It doesn't matter that much. Or if you want to, you can multiply everything by a negative sign. If I multiply everything by negative sign, this will be interchanged. And this also will be interchanged. So that's what I have written. Okay, so now if you tell me what is the sum of this sigma, I can answer your question. Why? Because I will calculate the limit of Sn when n goes to infinity. So this becomes the limit of 1 minus 1 over n plus 1, n goes to infinity. But this is extremely simple. Because when n becomes extremely large, the limit of the second term becomes 0, and this becomes just simply 1. Yes? So the limit of the partial sequence of partial sums converges to 1. So in principle, it's not bad to write this. You can immediately write that, okay, this sum is 1. Or, of course, the better way to write it is to say that this infinite series converges to 1. Yes, is that clear? Okay, let me give you one example of this type and then we can actually move on. For example, what is, the, what is your opinion about the sigma ln of 1 plus 1 over n? n goes from 1 to infinity. So we want to do more or less the same thing here. Okay, so you see I haven't even started theorems. 
I am just using the definition, okay? So how should I do that again? Let us uh, do everything from scratch. You have an infinite series. What you see infinite in, instead of an infinite series defines a, a sequence for you. So let me call it AN. But my goal to answer the questions of convergence and divergence boils down to finding SN if possible, or at least to convince myself if SN is convergent or divergent. They are equivalent questions. So here SN is sigma, K goes from one to N, not to infinity, LN of one plus one over K. Okay, tell me, is that understandable? So from this AN, I constructed SN, which is a new sequence. Yes? Please tell me, are you confused or not? So here, this infinite series goes to infinity, but I want to write SN. SN means A1 plus A2 plus up to AN. Instead of writing it like that, I wrote it as a sigma again. But this sigma is totally different from this sigma because that is the sum of finitely many terms. That is the sum of infinitely many terms. Okay, okay. So, do you have do you have, have any idea? Do you see that this can also be solved using telescopic rule? Because for a telescopic rule or telescopic sum, we need the diff sum of the difference of two terms, which in a very particular form. Do you see how can I do that here? So, S n is equal to. Can you guide me? Yes, why? Because you take the common denominator first, it becomes k plus 1 over k, yes? And then you know this is a famous formula of ln. ln of a fraction can be written as ln of the numerator minus the ln of the denominator, yes? So k it goes from 1 to n. But is it a telescopic sum? Yes. What is the function? The function here is in your head, you can construct it as ln of x. Then this becomes f of k plus 1, this becomes f of k. So that's exactly the telescopic sum. So what I'm supposed to do, I go to the one with the higher counter and choose the bigger number and put instead of k. So this becomes ln of n plus 1. And then I go to the one term with the lower counter and then put this one. So this becomes just ln of n plus 1. Yes? So ln of 1 is 0. So this means that Sn is ln of n plus 1. And now I ask you, what is the limit of Sn? Is infinite. So this means that, no, this series converges, sorry, diverges to infinity. So this, this diverges to infinity. Yes? Yes? Mm -hmm. I don't know what is your question. The question is about how I found the limit. No, but more general. Mm -hmm. no, I might. Uh, so I don't know. In any way, so might be that's not a good idea. I didn't know how to write it down. So uh, you don't need, really don't need to bother about the function. As far as you see, this is a very simple idea. If you open this sigma term by term, they will be canceled out. So even if you don't guess the function, it doesn't matter at all. Yes? Okay. Uh, so understandable? So this is the first way to understand the convergence or divergence of a infinite series but of course of an infinite series of course you understand that this is not this is a coincidence they have artifacted the problem in a way they have engineered the problem in a way that i can do it in that way most of the time i am not able to calculate those sums in a closed form okay and then i have to answer this question should i give up the this question uh, or this idea if the series is convergent or divergent or still i can find a way at least to convince myself that the series is convergent or divergent, even if I cannot find its sum. Yes? So that's the idea. Uh, okay. If you are interested, I can write one for you. You can think about it for yourself. And then on Friday, probably, if you are interested, we can solve about it. So just think about this problem. Sigma 
k goes from 1, no, sorry, n goes from 1 to infinity, and this is your sequence. Uh, n plus 1 square root of n plus n square root of n plus 1. I don't even need this pair of brackets. So the question is, is it convergent or divergent, which is a very simple question to answer based on the theorem that we will study a little bit later. But here, I am asking you to find its sum. So I am just guiding you that try to use this idea. Okay, I want you to be able to find the sum of this infinite series. Okay, now let us go to the next topic. The next topic is a very famous series. I have a little bit of board here, and that is this series that I started here. There is a name for this series. It's called harmonic series, okay? So harmonic series is this series. So this series that I write here is called harmonic series. The sum of the reciprocals of natural numbers. Okay? What is your intuition about convergence or divergence of this series? So for example, by the way, when I ask this question intuitively, just trust your intuition. What do I mean? I mean that if I start adding these, uh, these term by term, do you think at some point the sum becomes infinitely large? Because here you see that I do not have any problems by oscillation, yes? because all the terms involved are positive. So when I start going to the other terms, I am always adding a new number. Of course, the new number is always smaller than the previous one. And the numbers that I am adding becomes a smaller and a smaller. Yes, that's clear. But at least I am adding something. Okay, what do you think? Do you think that at the end, this sum will blow up or somehow asymptotically approaches to a number which cannot exceed above that? What do you think? Yeah, that is a, actually a little bit counterintuitive. I use Wolfram Alpha, I, rem, I, I don't remember exactly. But if you calculate from one, I think, up to 100 million, yes, it does not go beyond 100, this sum. Yes? So you can check it, go to Wolfram Alpha, so and then ask Wolfram Alpha to calculate this sum, for example, from one to, I don't know, one billion, one, a very big number. You see that it does not become that big. So you might get this idea that this series, at the end of the day, as you said, it will actually approach us to a limit asymptotically. But the surprising thing is that, no, this diverges to infinity. Okay, but it diverges to infinity extremely slow. Okay, but at the end, it will be bigger than any number that you imagine. But of course, you have to be patient and go further and further. If I ask you, can I make this sum larger than one? Of course, the answer is immediate. One plus one half is already above one. Can I make it bigger than 10? The answer is yes, but you have to be a little bit more patient to add more terms. Can I make it bigger than 100? You have to be a little bit patient and calculate 100 million terms. Okay, then if you are that patient, it passes of 100. Okay, but it passes to, uh, from every number. We want to show this. So we want to show that this harmonic series is a very uh, typical example. You should memorize it at the end after understanding it. So you remember this series is divergent, divergent to infinity. There are two methods, actually, that uh, we can prove this. Let me uh, use the idea of subsequence here, okay? So what is Sn? Uh, Sn is the sum of 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 up to 1 over n, yes? So the idea hasn't changed. I need to set up a new sequence and discuss about its convergence or divergence in order to be able to answer the same question for this infinite series, yes? 
Okay, so what I tell you, what I want to prove for you, I want to prove for you that any number that you give to me, if I am patient enough, I can make this number bigger than that number that you give to me. If I can show to this to you, then it means that this cannot be convergent, yes? Because if you tell me 100, I will tell you how much you need to go to guarantee that this sum is larger than 100. If you give me 1,000, I will tell you how much you need to go to make sure that it is bigger than 1,000. And then you can repeat this for any number that you give to me, no matter how big that number is. Yes? Is that clear? So that's the strategy. Now this means that, for example, let me calculate, so let me give me, let, let me consider a number n, which is a natural number, and let me con calculate s 2 to power n. Yes? First of all, I want you to tell me what is the name of what I have written here with respect to this. Um, it's not a subsequence because I fixed n here. In the way that I am talking about, I fixed n. But I can, I can, uh, I can write... I can write s to power, so forget about this. I can write s to power n, then it, you are right. This is, becomes a subsequence of that. But if I ask you what is this, this is 1 plus the reciprocal of the next number, plus the reciprocal of the next number, and then plus the reciprocal of the next number, and I have to be patient and continue until I reach to where? Can you tell me what should I write at the end? For example, if I ask you S5, you write 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5, stop. And now I am asking S of this number. For example, if I ask you S of 2 to power 4, what does it mean? It means S what? S 16. So you go from 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, up to 1 over 16. Yes? So that's the same idea, but here I gave you the number, here I have written n. So you start the same process, 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, up to? Up to? To, well, to the power of n, yes. First of all, tell me, understandable for everyone? So that is the sum. Okay, but now this, you need to arrange it in a very strange way, okay? So you arrange it like this, you write 1, and then you write 1 over 2. But then you write 1 over 3 and 1 over 4 together. Okay? And then you write 1 over 5, 1 over 6, 1 over 7, 1 over 8 together. Yes? And then can you guess what will be the next? I think you might see the, the, the pattern. What do you think I will write next? So 1 is separate, forget about 1. 1 over 2 alone. 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 together. 1 over 5, 1 over 6, 1 over 7, 1 over 8 together. Can you guess what I will write next? Definitely it will start with 1 over 9, 1, 1, 1 over 10. How much do you think I will go? No, because do you see what is 2, what is 4, what is 8? 4 is 2 to power 2, 8 is 2 power 3, so I will go to 2 to power 4. So I will continue until I reach to 1 over 16. Okay, let me repeat again. What is coming next? 1 over 17, 1 over 18, up to 1 over 32. Thank you. Okay, now the hard part reaches here. If I continue, what is the very last pair of brackets? The last term is clear. What is the last term here? 1 over, exactly, thank you. Okay. So what is the previous term? Can you tell me what's the previous term? 2 to power n, 1 unit less. Yes? Do you agree? And then what do you think I will write here? 
you need to look. What is the first term here? This was a power of two. This is the first number after the first power of two. This was another power of two. That was the first number after this uh, second power of two. Yes. So can you tell me now, this is the nth power of two. So what is this number here? May you repeat? Two to power? No, I think this was correct. Yes? Do you agree? Understandable this? Yes or no? Okay. So now, this, let me write this one and then we are done. So let me write here. This is greater than or equal to. I copy and paste one. I copy and paste one half. But from here, instead of one over three, I put one over four. Okay? First of all, do you agree with me till now? Because one is the same. One over two is the same. Do you agree that one over three plus one over four is larger than one over four plus one over four? Because 1 over 3 is larger than 1 over 4, yes? And then, can you tell me what, what will I do for the next term? Instead of 1 over 5, I write 1 over 8. Yes? Do you agree? Because 1 over 5 is larger than 1 over 8. 1 over 6 is larger. 1 over 7 is larger, but 1 over 8 is the same. So then I will continue this process and then instead of this one, what I write, can you tell me? 1 over 2n. The next one, 1 over 2n and then I continue 1 over 2n, yes? So hopefully you are convinced that this is working. Okay, now can you tell me how can I simplify that? There is a very nice way of simplifying this. One one half but what is this sum one half what is the next sum because four times one over eight it is one half and what is the last sum uh, did i make a mistake or not yes i made a uh, i made no no i didn't make a mistake that's correct so what is the answer here how many terms are there from here to there? How many terms? N? So we have to be careful. How many terms are there from there to, can you calculate it? So how many numbers are there from one to 10? No, 10. That's always tricky. When I ask how many numbers are there from one, including one to 10, including 10, if you write 10 minus one, that is wrong. You have to write 10 minus one plus one. So this means that you have to write 2 to the power of n minus 2 to the power of n minus 1 plus 1, yes? Which is, uh, no, that is plus 1, sorry. Okay, so this becomes 2 to power n minus 2 to power minus 1, and this becomes minus 1 plus 1. So that is your number. But let me factor 2 to power minus 1, 2 to power n minus 1 out. So you made a very big mistake. You said n. There are 2 to power n minus 1 terms involved. Understandable or not? Am I confusing you? So let me ask you, how many terms are, so let me, this, these are standard questions, by the way. So let me write this sequence, 2 to power n minus 1 plus 1, 2 to power n minus 1 plus 2, and I continue this process, 2 to power n minus 1, 2 to power n. I am asking you how many terms you see here. What is the name of this? It's arithmetic progression. Arithmetic progression, every term is obtained from the previous term by adding one to, one to it. Okay? And I want to see how many terms are involved. If you want to see how many terms are involved, you take the last one, minus the first one, 
but exactly like 10 and 10 and 1 you shouldn't write 10 minus 1 you should write 10 minus 9 1 minus 1 but plus 1 if you calculate this minus 1 and 1 are gone so it becomes 2 to power n minus 2 to power n minus 1 and then if i factor 2 to power n minus 1 out 2 is left from here minus 1 is left from here but 2 minus 1 is 1 so this becomes 2 to the power of n minus 1 so if I ask you how many terms you see in this last pair of brackets, it's not n. It's 2 to the power of n minus 1. Okay? Okay. And then, so this means that uh, the answer to this was 1 half. The answer to this was 1 half. What is the answer to this? How many terms are there? 2 to the power of n minus 1. But what is each number? Each number is 1 over 2n. And if you simplify that, again, it becomes 1 over 2. So if I add all of them, it is 1 over 2 again. Okay? So it is 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, until 1 over 2 at the end. But how many 1 over 2s we have now? Are there? No, not infinite. Because I have reached to n. So how many 1 over 2 I have? No, this one is also included. I have 1 over 2 here. So that I have exactly n 1 over 2. Yes? So this becomes, finally, 1 plus n over 2. So, so this is 1 plus 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, up to 1 over 2. How many 1 over 2s do you see? n of them. So this becomes n over 2. Okay, please convince yourself if you're not happy about that. But let me just finish this and then we have a break, okay? So now what I showed is this. What I showed, I showed that S divided by, sorry, S sub 2 to power N is greater than or equal to 1 plus N over 2. This is what I showed for all natural numbers N. Yes? So then I am done. Hopefully you agree with me, yes? Because, for example, if I choose appropriate n, the value of this sum becomes bigger than this one. For example, if you give me n to be, uh, sorry, if you give me 100 and you ask me, can I make this larger than 100, what I do, I would make this one larger than 100 and find n. So what is n? This, is, this means that n should be greater than or equal to 200, uh, minus 198. So this means that if I choose n greater than 198, this number is greater than 100. So s sub 2 to power 198 will definitely go beyond 100. Of course, that is an exaggeration, but we don't care. We want just to show that this can happen. Yes? Is that clear? So we just proved that S sub 2 to power N is larger than this one. In, an, in other way, if, if this limit exists, this is a subsequence, what is the limit of this part? It is clear when I send N to infinity, this becomes infinity. And a subsequence of that is larger than infinity. So the limit of this subsequence is also infinity. This means that the sequence itself also diverges to infinity because one subsequence of that will diverge to infinity. Okay. Okay. So uh, sorry for that, but uh, let us stop here and then have a break for 10 uh, until 635 and come back again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let me also uh, present another proof for this because that is something that you need to know the trick because that is important even for exam problems. So we want to still prove that the harmonic series is divergent. The proof is much simpler and this is the proof given in Adams and I will tell you, I was thinking that why uh, in analysis books they will they give you this proof rather than the proof given in Adams. The reason is that in Adams, the proof is based on integrals. 
And in more advanced courses, when they start, they start with sequences before even studying integrals. So they have to somehow motivate that this is correct before even reaching to the topic of integrals. But if you know the integrals, then might be it is easier. And this that I describe here is important even for the exam to know, okay? So that is a very uh, interesting trick. So I want to discuss about uh, this uh, uh, series again, harmonic series. So what I do, I consider a function motivate inspired by this form. I would call it one over X. Okay. And I will try to intuitively make it clear for you. Uh, of course, here, the domain is restricted to positive values. So you know that one over X has two branches, but I don't, this, I don't need this part because it corresponds to the negative values of X and I don't want it. So if I ask you what is the that branch that I am interested, so let me consider let me exaggerate a little bit. So this is one and one. You know that one and one is on the graph here, and then it goes asymptotically like this, yes. Something like that. So this is the graph of one over x on that part that I am interested in. So then what you do uh so this is n, this is one. Let me, the next number is two. The next number is three. And then I continue like this and I reach to n at some point. Yes. Okay. And now let me ask you, what is this height? Can you tell me? So let me just not mess up the picture. So what is this height? one because this is your function f of x is equal to one over x okay so let me just make this clear so this length as you told me is one unit yes what is this length one over two yes because you put two in the function it becomes one over two and what is the next length is one over three and then if you continue what is this length is 1 over n. Okay. But the point is that I want to estimate the area below the curve with the area of some rectangles. Okay. So the width of each one of them is one unit. Yes. So if I complete this one, yes, can you tell me what is the area here? How much is this area? So you already knew this length is one, this width is also one, so this area is just one. Yeah, so that area is one. So this means that this is one. The area here is one. And now let us go to the next one and complete this rectangle here. And I ask you the same question about this area. What is this area? This area is this length multiplied by this width the width is again one but the height is one half so if you multiply that this area is nothing this area is nothing except one half yes and you continue like this for example the next one i hope that you agree this is four this is three and what is this area I agree that this area is one over three do you agree? Yes. And if you continue here, uh, so what should I do? Uh, so let me let me make this one n minus one here, and the next one becomes n. Sorry for this; it's very small now. Okay. So this is n. Okay. I want to complete this. Uh, do I need one over n as well? Okay. Uh, so this is always confusing for me. So let me see. Because I want to say that this is bigger than that area. Okay. And then. Okay. So let me go up to. So let me take this one n. But let me take this one n plus one. Okay. That is my mistake. Okay. And then I complete it here. Okay. So this is n plus one. Sorry. Okay. So if I ask you what is the area of this rectangle finally. 
it will tell me their area of the final rectangle is how much is 1 over n. Yes? So this means that uh, Sn is actually is the sum of all the areas of these rectangles. Okay? So uh, Sn is sigma k goes from 1 to n of 1 over k which becomes these areas. Do you agree that this sum that you see here is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 over 3 up to 1 over n? This is the meaning of this sum. But on the other hand, based on what I uh, described, this sum is the sum of the areas of these rectangles. And this area, if you add them, it is larger than the area below the curve from 1 up to n plus 1. Do you agree? So this becomes this becomes larger than the area below the curve. But we learn how to calculate the area below the curve using integral. So I have to write the function dx, and the limits are from one up to n plus one, not n, because of that picture. So it goes from one up to n plus one. So I realize that S n which is this one, based on this idea, is larger than this integral. But that integral is very simple to calculate. This is just ln of absolute value of x, which goes from 1 to n plus 1. n plus 1 is positive, so I don't need absolute value. So this becomes that. And ln of 1 is 0. So I was able to show that Sn is larger than ln of n plus 1. For all n. So that is a much simpler proof. And this idea is the topic of a lot of exam questions. So try to learn it. I will, of course, next session we will also discuss more harder problems here. But this idea is now hopefully clear for you that Sn is larger than Ln plus 1. Okay, can Sn be bounded? from above. No, because Sn for any value of n is larger than Ln of n plus 1. And Ln of n plus 1 eventually goes beyond every number that you can imagine when n becomes large, since the limit of Ln of n plus 1, n goes to infinity, is infinity. And Sn is larger than this one, so this cannot be bounded. If it is not bounded, it cannot be convergent, so it diverges to infinity. Yes? Is the idea clear? So you see that the calculations is much simpler. And this trick I want you to learn. We have two estimates about the area. If I use circumscribed uh, rectangles, I will go beyond. I will get something more than the area. If I consider the inscribed rectangles, I will get something smaller than the area. Both of them are needed. So if we have time today or not to, uh, on Friday, we will also see those kinds of problems. Okay, so we actually pass this one. Okay, so that is, hopefully we can cover this topic as well. This is one of the most important series that you need to know, and that is called geometric series, okay? You, in, in high school, you have studied arithmetic progression and geometric progression. Progression means that you have a sequence, but it is finite. In calculus, when we say sequence, I mean that it continues until infinity, infinitely many terms, okay? So, uh, I, have a, I have a series of this form. N goes from one, I don't know, one I have written, yes. N from one to infinity, I have a constant number A multiplied by another constant R to the power of N minus one. If you can write your series in this form, this is called a geometric series, yes? This is geometric series, and A is the first term, why? Because if I put n equals to one, r to power zero is one, is one. so this is left, A is left for me, which is the first term. And then r is called the common ratio. the common ratio. So if you, if you want to uh, intuitively expand that, this is just A, A times R, 
a times r squared a times r cubed and continues forever and this is why it is called geometric series because every term is obtained from the previous term by being multiplied by a constant number r so it is like geometric progression but of course it goes to infinity we call it we have infinitely many terms it is called geometric series and then we want to understand when this geometric series is this is one of those few cases that we can solve the problem in full detail so we want to know when this series is convergent when this series is divergent when it is convergent can i find it sum you will see the answer is yes and then you have to memorize the formulas at the end okay so what you want to do let us try to understand this problem we can consider a lot of scenarios okay so let me consider these cases so this is the real numbers here is minus one here is one these are the numbers are important so i can consider this point i can consider this point i can consider region one with less than minus one i can consider region two between minus one and one and i can consider region three a strictly greater than one yes so in principle we should be able to discuss the convergence or divergence of this series for all these cases okay so uh, some of them are actually indeed simple for example what will happen if r is one do you think that the series is divergent or convergent in that case if r is one if r is one all the terms are actually equal to a and then if i ask you in that case if r is one can you tell me what will be sn sn means the sum of all terms yes from the first term up to uh, nth term so what is sn here if r is one the first term is a the second term is a the third term is a so i am adding a bunch of a's together how many of them n of them so this becomes n times a yes and now i am asking you what is the limit of sn when n goes to infinity infinity of course a shouldn't be zero and that is clear if a is zero i don't have anything so in principle a should be considered not zero okay okay so this means that this limit goes to infinity so it is clear when r is one geometric series diverges to infinity so we solve this problem what happens for r minus one this alternatingly becomes positive negative positive negative yes so i mean we will get two cases either i will get uh, 2a or i will get zero do you agree depending so one of the i get one sequence of constant terms 2a one se subsequence of constant terms zero so this approaches to 2a this approaches to zero they are not equal to divergent again so for minus one that is also divergent so we uh, understood that but be be, be clear these two divergences are different in nature do you agree this diverges to infinity but this simply diverges not to infinity okay so here diverges to infinity just simply diverges simply diverges okay now let us uh, consider other scenarios so if i do not have these cases it means that either absolute value of r is smaller than one strictly or absolute value of r is larger than one absolute value of r is smaller than one it means that i am in this region absolute value of r larger than one is either in the first region or in the third region okay but let me now calculate sn actually independent of these numbers sn means the first term the second term the third term up to nth term okay this is sn but this is a high school problem this is the sum of a geometric progression and then you had the formula hopefully somewhere in high school so sn becomes but let me just write the formula sn becomes the first term multiplied by one minus the common ratio to power of the number of terms which is n divided by one minus r so this is one of those cases that i can write these three dots in a closed form 
And now I can ask you the question. So assume that absolute value of R is smaller than one. Then what happens? The limit of SN, can you tell me what happens for the limit? I have to take the limit of this expression. Of course, I haven't uh, had time to go through all these things in detail, but I think intuitively it shouldn't be hard for you. When I send n to infinity, this part and this part are not affected because they don't depend on n. So this is the only one which depends on n. What would be the limit of that part when n goes to zero under these circumstances? Intuitively, I haven't proven that. Not, not n equal to zero. For example, what is the limit? Choose a number between minus one and one. So let me say one over two, for example, and raise it to power n and send n to infinity. What the answer is? Intuitively. Zero, because this can be written as limit of one over two to power n, n goes to infinity, and this becomes zero, yes? Yes, and this, this, this turns out to be true for all numbers between minus 1 and 1, not just only for this positive one. So this becomes, the limit of this part becomes 0 under that condition, and then this limit becomes A over 1 minus R. So this is something that you have to remember. If the common ratio is a number is strictly between minus 1 and 1, then the geometric series actually converges and we have a formula for its sum. The sum is A, the first term, 1 minus the common ratio. That is the formula. Okay? But what happens if R is larger than 1? You have to take the same limit, but this time R is larger than 1. So what happens for the limit? Oh, sorry. What happens for Sn? Take the limit of this one under this condition and send n to, R, n to infinity. What happens? If you have a number larger than 1, for example, you can think immediately about, for example, 2. I have 2 to power infinity. What happens? It becomes infinity. And 1 minus infinity becomes negative infinity. Okay? So be careful. This part becomes negative infinity. What happens for the denominator? Because R is assumed to be larger than 1, the denominator is also negative. So this negative and that negative I will cancel. So far I have infinity. So then the result will depend to the sign of A. Yes? So it becomes positive infinity if A is positive. It becomes negative infinity if A is negative. Yes, so it either diverges to infinity or minus infinity based on the conditions that you apply for A. And then finally, the last idea, what happens if I have R less than minus 1? For example, let me ask you this question. What do you think would be the limit of minus 2 to power N? Pardon? Okay, so that is my question. Is it negative infinity or positive infinity? But we, we, we don't have any control on that. N goes to infinity. So exactly what you said is correct, but this is not possible to write one scenario. You have to consider two cases, yes? So, so it means that um, if N is even, it becomes positive infinity. If n is odd, it becomes negative infinity. When I say n even, I am considering a subsequent of even terms. It goes to infinity. And when I write n is odd, I am considering a subsequence of odd terms. It goes to minus infinity. So again, the, the, we know it diverges, but it is not clear diverges to where, diverges to nowhere. Yes? So that's it. So we, if, if r is less than 1, the, 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 the series simply diverges. Okay. So is that clear? So this information you need to know, especially, especially this is the most important case. So we would say that 
Now, because we considered every scenario, we can say that the geometric series converges if and only if R is less than 1. Were there any other cases? No. This is the only case that it was convergent. So it converges if and only if the common ratio, the absolute value of the common ratio, is strictly smaller than 1. Yes? Now you speak louder. This is in my ear. I cannot hear. Yes? Yes? AR? Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, you are right. Thank you. Sorry. This is AS. Thank you. Okay. Now this is something that you know. We have a little bit of time. So if you don't mind, let me just solve one example for you. Uh, okay. Determine if the following series are convergent. If they are, determine the sum, okay? So you can see it here on the screen. And let me write it here. So just this is the last example for today. And then I think we can uh, cover everything left next time on Friday, okay? So here, you, you want to see what happens for this series. Minus 5 to power n divided by 8 to power 2n n goes from to 2 to infinity. First of all, you need to have an idea that this might be a, a geometric series. Why is that? I would recommend you whenever you see, I don't know, this power of n, this n appears in a power form, you should have, you should guess probably it might be the case that this is a geometric series. To convince yourself of, try to start write two or three terms, okay? For example, if I put two, it becomes, and don't calculate, by the way, you don't need to calculate. It's minus five to power two, and then eight to power four. Don't calculate, just I want you to see the pattern. And then go next, plus, I put n equals to three, it becomes minus five to power three, eight to power what? Uh, six, do you agree? And let me write one more, then I hope that you realize that this is indeed a geometric series. If I put 4, it becomes 4 and then 8 to power 8. Now hopefully you see that every time a constant number is multiplied by a previous number to get the other one, yes? This co continues. Can you see? The first term is clear. If this is a geometric series, this will play the role of A for you. Okay, but is there, what is the common ratio? Can you see that? What is that number which is multiplied every time to produce the next term? Minus five over two. Uh, minus five over eight to power two, you are right. Because the numerators are constantly being multiplied by minus five. So I have a minus five here. And the denominator is being constantly multiplied by eight to power two. So this means that this is that number which is all the time multiplied producing the next number. So this is your actually uh, common ratio. Okay, so then everything is clear. Is it convergent or divergent? I go back to this theorem. The absolute value of this number is definitely smaller than 1. So this means that, yes, this series is convergent and converges if they ask where, you have to remember this formula. So this, yes, it converges to, uh, you need to remember the formula. The first term is minus 5 to power 2 divided by 8 to power 4, and then 1 minus this common ratio. Yes? So I don't know, you simplify this. For example, if you multiply everything by 8 to power 4, the numerator becomes 25. This becomes 8 to power 4 plus 5 times 8 to power 2. I don't know, is there any way we can simplify it or not? I can factor 8 to power 2. This is 64 plus 5, 69. Yes, it is, it's, a, it, it's not possible to calculate right now, but the answer is this. So it converges to this number. Yes? Okay. Uh, okay, I will stop. It would be better if I start with this example to refresh your memory next time. Any questions? Thank you.